Hi, I'm Jonathan Wright, and today I'm going to be talking to you about testing as a service. A bit of background about myself. I've been doing automation since the early 90s, and that started with XRunner, then I went on to WinRunner, QTP, and now UFT, and some of the new AI and mobile capabilities that have recently been delivered. And also, I've been talking about testing as a service since about 2010. And so some of my slides will come from my keynote at the British Computer Society on the right hand side. So you can download those on my slide share. You can also contact me on linkedin.com slash in slash automation. And also check out some of the stuff that I've been talking about on AI and cognitive engineering. So application delivery management. Like I said, when I started back in the 90s, I started on TestDirector 1.51. Now that was felt more like Excel than it did to what you see today in some of the new capabilities that are available. And I went through TestDirector to, uh, to Quality Center and then on to the Agile Manager platform and then on to Octane. So I kind of got the experience all the way from the, the old TD API all the way through to some of the next generation predictive capabilities that are coming through. And you know, I'm really excited to talk to you today about testing as a service and how that kind of goes hand in hand with the application delivery management tools available from Microfocus. So why as a service? Um, I guess this is an interesting question. You know, would you be the best person to build the hardware for, you know, say for instance, a self-driving car? Now, if your background is a hardware engineer, then absolutely. Are you the best person to develop the software on that or the platform for that? And that car 2x or infrastructure 2x talking to the different uh, you know, traffic lights and the protocols required. At what level do you feel that you come in? Would you be responsible for maybe what the UI looks like or the performance or security? So everyone has niche areas and you know the center of enablement. So let's talk about how do we unlock those capabilities for organizations that maybe aren't as mature in certain areas. Now, my background in testing as a service, I did a publication uh, on testing as a service models. I'd highly recommend checking that out. If you send me a message, I'll send you a copy. Uh, but it was my initial ideas around, well, why, are, why is this so important? And why is this move from testing as a function to really as a service? Uh, and what does that really mean in the real world? So there's some, some real world use cases in that. So when I was first asked about, well, what does testing as a service look like? I remember looking, creating this, this huge diagram that all the, the bits and bobs, you know, how the cloud fits together with the functional testing as a service, test automation as a service, then fuels the performance testing as a service. And I think we've moved on quite uh, far down the line with reuse and lean engineering and digital engineering. And that's where I wanted to kind of explore some of these exciting models with you. So I guess the drive really behind this is opportunities, right? So, you know, pay as you use, more flexible around creating your own SLAs, you know, new standards, you know, better visibility of your progress. You know, I think there's a lot of new opportunities when it comes to these as a service models. I also think, you know, the ability to have that scale on demand, you know, the ability to access this remotely, to be able to be hugely portable, to be able to, you know, not really start off with a, you know, any for an investment. And that could be also, you know, in people, you know, part of it is there's lots of different challenges that every day you face, especially if you're testing. And so what we're trying to do really, if we go back a step a little bit here, is we're trying to solve a business problem, an idea, a challenge, you know, and there's the normal kind of cost benefit time to market that we're trying to accelerate. And at the bottom end, you know, part of it is we get that solution delivered and we either want a bit of the triangle, is it cheap, is it good, is it fast, and we have to make a, uh, a, a decision on that. So as a service, really unlocks that kind of capability to deal with a problem definition all the way to a solution and an outcome at the other uh, at the other end and for the business and also the end users to be involved and really it becomes more of a black box than you know you having to establish those capabilities 
equally, you know, we'll have heard quite a lot in the industry around shift right and shift left. Uh, most of the talks that I've been talking about on my TED talk, which I put at the start, talks about shift right. Talks about learning from the right hand side to create what's on, on the left hand side. And we just finished doing this for, for Brexit and you know Black Friday actually around building mod performance models of realistic load on the Black Friday situation, and that was taken from my APM tool, which then drove my load runner profiles. Now. PAL or performance application lifecycle has been around as long as I have. And you know, that's that capability which we should be unlocking. Yes, shift right left is important, but actually shift right is even more important. And then the up down is maybe a bit of a joke, but it's actually around how do we unlock that clear transparency between business and value and insight coming from your actual customers or digital users like your Alexas, your Car2X, etc. etc. So why would they provide better solutions? And so I kind of wanted to start this as a kind of a question around, well, the great thing about having testing as a service providers is they already have the blueprint to build these kind of highly complex systems. They also have all the patterns. Now, I remember contributing this pattern to the uh, test automation patterns of Wikispace, which I think unfortunately has been decommissioned. It was something that I worked on with Dorothy Graham. And part of that was a whole stack of recipes, and I give you a bit of an example slash plug of bug uh, for the, the UFT test engineers cookbook that I did. And I remember when I built that, it was all about reusable components. You know, how do you, you know, uh, go through and grab all of the different URLs off, off a page, you know, little bits of snips that of, of code that you could use as a kind of to extend your capabilities. So really, the great thing about testing as a service is they already have the blueprints, the patterns, and the recipes. And part of them, they're applying them into your context, in your domain. So part of it is we take away this kind of abstraction layer of the logistics, you know, the challenges around everyday testing. And what we're doing is we're just providing that as a service. So really, businesses can focus on being a business not being at a center of enablement for testing. So what does that actually look like? Well, if you think about all the, the different components within test, so you're testing your requirements, so your requirements engineering aspects, your uh, deployment, your uh, release, your support, your operations, and there's a lot of different, com uh, different types of communication between these layers. There's the, you know, the CMMIs, the, the business process model limitation, you know, the uh, IT tills foundations is the um, IT frameworks, uh, IT for IT. You know, part of it is there's lots of different standards and communications between each layer. By enabling testing as a service, you're unlocking some of those abilities to communicate between left and right and silos, which unfortunately have existed for quite a long time. So does that, what does that do? Well, hopefully that improves the visibility of what's actually getting delivered and tested. So, you know, I take a non-functional example for this particular thing. In the center, you've got a non-functional requirement and that links to some associated risk from a business perspective, some benefit, you know, some representation of what that actually is to the individual transaction or the test that's being run in whichever technology and data that's required around it. So there's a whole stack of quite a complex uh, you know, landscape, but we want, in essence, we want a real-time dashboard that our testing's getting done and things are improving. So part of it is we want the tools and we want the dashboards, which is something we've never really had the time to do. And part of it is with all this new data, we want to be able to create insight. And this is where a lot of the new tools like Octane are taking the data using predictive analytics and starting to predict, you know, failures, issues, areas which you need to focus on a little bit more in the application. So we want more improved insight. You know, this is a bit overkill, this particular slide, but I, it kind of shows you what the life cycle may or may not look like in your organization. You know, you might be doing the UX, you might be doing some other type of me methodology, but it starts off with a requirement and executable spec, an idea, a hypothesis, 
you know, you'll have your business uh, analysts, your product owners, you'll have your, you know, people uh, which you've got to translate from a requirements engineering perspective into, um, you know, actual code, then into your QA, your integration testing, your, your business acceptance testing, user acceptance testing, then into some kind of DevOps pipeline, and then off into an operational question. Now, this very linear process that you see here may be classed as waterfall. You may put class it as an iterative approach of doing this uh, and look at more agile or scaled agile approaches like, say, version 5. But, you know, e either way you look at it, part of it is you're then moving into, say, for instance, an operational space where there's ITIL, there's different standards, and this may be the ITAM event that I would highly recommend that you uh, attend next week, which we're ready. So unlocking all this gives you the ability to shift right, to take what you've learned on the right-hand side, to reinforce on the left, the operational tools will give you all these capabilities around intelligence, insight, delivery, in continuous improvement. And this is what organizations are looking for. They're wanting to get better at what they do. But you should be innovating as much on the right-hand side in operations as you should be in your software development lifecycle. Also, part of what this testing as a service thing is it moves away from hero courses. You know, part of it is you build you know, heroes within your organizations who could be your uh, your DevOps infrastructure people, your test automation gurus. You know, part of it is you don't want to rely on a single point of failure or have knowledge that is retained by a small pocket of the, the organization. And this is really where testing as a service moves into more of a factory model where you can actually, you know, scale up, scale down and not worry about, you know, specific resource pools or hero country to save the day. So moving on to exploring some of these testing as a service models. Now I've just added a few uh, on the left hand side here of things that I've kind of seen in the, the then of the industry and I just kind of wanted to kind of you know throw ideas out there. But what we do know, and definitely on the right, right hand side, you can see, I remember when I worked for a company called Grid Tools based out in Oxford, I remember coming into the, um, into the office one day and looking at some of the equations that the applied maths physics guys had put up around, say, for instance, test coverage and how complex this is. You know, I understand people have a good idea of, of coverage techniques. They may also do have, have done things like code coverage and static code analysis and use different tools and techniques for that. But part of the question is, are you the best position to do these hugely complex calculations? It, or is it just a requirements matrix that you're getting out of ALM? Or do you need something more to give you an idea of the heat map of within your application directly down to lines of code, right? So part of it is there's different levels. I think it goes all the way from infrastructure to platforms, to your particular test type. So your automation, your functional testing, your, your API testing, your mobile testing, your performance testing, your IoT testing, and your digital testing kind of things, and your security testing. Um, and, you know, part of it is there's so many different uh, disciplines. It's, you know, to be master of all would be incredibly difficult. So I'm going to start with infrastructure. And this is one that's quite close to my heart, mainly because Today, for me, when I'm recording this, it's Cyber Monday. So Cyber Monday, I've literally spent all day on Load Runner and a few other tools like the Shunra acquisition they made to network virtualization, service virtualization, and all the lifecycle virtualization tools. And I've been utilizing the MicroFocus RPA tool to actually go off with things like Fortify to go and look at security. You know, I've been monitoring stability with uh, you know Performance Center. Uh, now, Loader in a cloud, you know, and Loader in an enterprise, um, you know, being able to scale up and, you know, and monitor 10,000 different um, um, retailers across the globe. So I've been doing this with myself, uh, Todd DiCaprio, who uh, uh, was MicroFocus, uh, and also the, the, who wrote a book, Effective Performance Engineering, uh, which I highly recommend checking out. I, I think I've got the link later on. Uh, and then over in Australia, a good friend of mine, Stuart Moncrief, who runs the website myloadtest.com, which is a big uh, blog around load runner and different tools and tips around how to get the best out of those tools. What we did is we've come together and every year we run 
uh, a report looking at organizations and giving them a grade. Uh, you know, we've just had a few major issues this year. So people like Costco, uh, which had lost 11 million pounds uh, from their website going down, you know, to organizations in the UK that are, unfortunately have gone down. And like we had, unfortunately, NatWest from a big banking platform went down on, on Cyber Monday and Black Friday. So, you know, we've got these challenges. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to help organizations identify potential challenges that they may have and, and, and come up with ways of fixing them. So you know, infrastructure is really important and being able to understand and benchmark that is, is one aspect. Test platforms as a service. Now I'm actually going to go on to the next slide in a second, but uh, back in 2000, as you can see by one of the top left of the slides, back in 2011, I was looking at building the uh, test automation as a service platforms. Uh, and try to understand how you look at, you scale these up, how you build infrastructure as code, you know, uh, automation as code, test data as code, use model-based testing to uh, to actually understand the dependencies between different mod reusable mod modules, and also then be able to monitor and measure the execution of that. So part of it was, I, I need all these platforms and all these technologies of which microfocus are the leaders in this kind of area. And what I want to be able to do is bring them all together, whether it's security, performance, uh, or functional. And I want to be able to leverage those using the same business context that works for my organization. Um, so, you know, part of it is you need to be able to have the test platforms as a service. You also need to be able to do, you know, test automation as a service. So the TAS.net which is a blog that used to be there if I'm tired. You know, I used to talk about things like performance testing as a service, you know, how you do high volume mobile testing, high volume automated testing, uh, using tools like Lean FT and containerization to be able to spin up and do huge testing. Uh, the example I've taken here on the left hand side, as you can see load runner running in this war room situation and a whole stack of us sat there scripting in load runner to get stuff done is that you know we're very good at bringing in specialist resource at the last minute to help get these things over as you can see from all the coffee that people are drinking but you know what we really want to do is we want to be able to just turn this on and off you know when it's black friday cyber monday and we need to prep and do high volumes of performance we can scale up into the load runner cloud and then when we want to be able to bring those capabilities more continuous you may be looking at more of the performance as code within your IDEs, be able to run things as part of a continuous delivery pipeline. So there's different times where you're doing different capabilities. Um, and also functional testing as a service, I'm going to throw that one in. And in this case, I'm showing some of the amazing capabilities that Microfocus have with their service virtualization capabilities. So if you don't have a service available, or if you're doing things like chaos engineering, you want to be able to emulate what a particular scenario, i.e. a service goes down, and that might be your, um, you know, uh, one of your, your messaging buses like an ESB, uh, you know, and, and you want to be able to replicate that. So, you know, that this capability is built straight into UFT. You see on the left hand side, you can literally connect, drag and drop them across, and then you can simulate different types of data response. So here's an example with, with WebSphere, but that could be uh, something completely different. Um, so I, my example here is a, a presentation that I did for service virtualization at Gartner. Uh, and it kind of gives you an idea of some of the kind of capabilities you can do with service virtualization and the power with your functional testing. And this could be for your API, so you can stub out your uh, request response pairs, etc. So the other area which is close to my heart, as I've just finished, uh, with helping the UK government with performance engineering and Brexit, you know, part of it is, you know, it's incredibly complex. And there's no way I'm going to be able to do it justice in one slide, 10 slides, 100 slides. So what I wanted to do is kind of refer um, Todd stuff. So the effective performance engineering to this book is sponsored by uh, HP Enterprise. So you can download that. Um, and it talks around load runner and things you should be looking at and measuring and monitoring because this is incredibly complex. So I'll give you an example of a product that we're doing in the cognitive engineering space. This is building um, uh, AI as a service or AI as a platform system. So in this case, we've got a knowledge graph here with uh, uh, 
the Neo4j stuff. You've got our uh, MongoDB stuff. You've got our consumers and producers coming through for being able to send messages. And also you've got things like AI as a service. So in the top right hand corner, this is actually a, 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 we, we, something we use for the UK government, which will actually understand and tune workload to understand configuration and work out how you tune the system uh, in real time to, uh, to actually, you know, get better performance and better through, do more with, with less. So incredibly complex landscapes. Um, and, you know, if you've not got those kind of skills in house, this is a great opportunity to then move to a performance testing of the service kind of model and consume it when you need it. So again, um, I help been doing some stuff with the, the UK government as well on security testing. Um, and I, I must admit, there's a huge overlap in the tools that I use. Uh, and I, I give you an example of one which I, I did for, for, for Black Friday. So, you know, I use things like Burp Suite on Kali to actually allow me to, to uh, spider or, or, or traverse uh, direct, uh, websites so I can understand what pages and content are out there so I can pass that information across to my load runner to actually then run it. So I'm using a security tool to actually run it on my Raspberry Pi behind me to actually allow me to uh, to give me the insight that then passes over for performance. So, you know, there's a lot of overlap, but also there's some great tools. Fortify is an amazing tool that allows you to then go off and get an understanding of, you know, your, your security risk and security challenges. So security testing as a service is another really good area that is sometimes very specialist, um, especially if you're doing penetration testing. Like I have a team of cyber reserves for the, who do that, who do that for the military. So, you know, the, there's so many capabilities that you may or may not have, which you want to augment with this kind of as a service model. So finally, I'm going to kind of talk about, I guess the digital testing as a service would be a better description, but monitoring and measuring. So a lot of what I, I mentioned about the shift right aspect. So this digital experience analytics. So how do you take monitoring on the right hand side from your, your uh, in the ITOM landscape, those APM tools, and how do you then generate models that you can use for testing? So I've done lots of talks on this. I'd recommend you look at that. That gives you an idea of how you can, you can generate load runner scripts on the left hand side, you can generate security, you can generate functional, you can generate API tests all from real things that are happening in the real world on the right hand side. So, you know, highly, you know, great place to look. And it also aligns with some of the AI ops kind of stuff that you'll be seeing coming through next year. So in summary, testing as a service. So really what we're talking about is uh, digital assurance. So this kind of high level of how do you help some uh, partner to actually give you assurance around the testing that you've actually had done. Uh, and I use the word digital quality because I, I did a, a book uh, called Digital Quality Hamburg, uh, which I'd highly recommend checking out. Um, and that was all about digital experiences over just customer experiences. So forgetting UIs, thinking about IoT endpoints, thinking about, you know, connected car, smart, uh, you know, smart devices that are coming through. And how do you enable that across all the life cycles? So then that digital testing, the level below, is the testing as a service model. It's the ability to do first day testing, so be able to test every single power of the system uh, automatically without having to go through and script it all by hand. The same as the shift right approach of bringing everything across from the right hand side and model it on the left hand side. There's the digital experience analytics and that ability to understand things like test data, uh, and how you generate synthetic test data and obfuscate data from the right hand side to be used to power your scenarios. And then there's things like test data coverage, test data as code, things like that. There's a lot of different areas that I would highly recommend for you to explore. So what's next in the industry? Now I've taken this slide from a, uh, an Octane uh, presentation that I, I did many years ago before it was released on uh, around predictive ALM, which was kind of the big drive, which they were, where the microfocus guys were doing. And some of it was around these, some of this capability on the left, which they now have. So the machine learning that you're seeing from some of the analytics platforms that they have, you know, the predictive capability around, 
you know, defect prediction, for instance, predictive planning, you know, understanding velocity, obviously being a huge driver this year. Uh, and then things like smarter test, impact analysis, you'll have heard about the NLP stuff, the computer vision, you know, smart builds and releases, you know, all, I've given a few snapshots, executive scorecard is kind of in the ALM area, some of the release tools, and then on to uh, Octane. And then, you know, how that really goes into this map of, well, this is the confidence level we have with the release. Here's some recommendation, even some uh, backlog items that you can go off and do to improve coverage or improve quality of your solution. So all this technology is coming down the line with the next gen uh, Octane uh, capabilities. So I definitely recommend to watch this space. So I'd like to say thank you for, for, for watching my session. Looking forward to taking some live Q&A next. Of course, if you want to discover more, I've added a few extra slides in here just for you to be able to go and get resources. Um, I, I'm the president of the, the Vivid community, so I do quite actively do blogging. Uh, on the right hand side is my last blog, which will cover the, uh, the Intelligent Enterprise RPA, which is from my trip uh, to South Africa and the release of the MicroFocus uh, RPA tool. Uh, and that kind of talks about you know my journey as you can see there from win from the X runner days to Win Runner to UFT and how things have changed. And then on the left hand side, the World Quality Report has just come out for 2019, 2020. Highly recommend that. But I will also be kind of doing another one around that in the new year. So plenty of great stuff there to check out on the Pivot Worldwide site. If you want to go a little bit further, of course, Joe, thanks so much for hosting this. Uh, my t last test talk, which I got around my shift right on the left hand side uh, and how you can achieve that in performance. And then I've got one around digital quality. I mentioned the, the World Quality Report, which I'm doing Christmas Day and the January sales. So that will be coming out at the end of December. And then I'd like to say a special thank you to Microfocus for uh, everything that they did in, uh, yesterday in day one, and it was some great sessions, uh, and I'm looking forward to taking some questions.